Okay, here we are. Um, what's up, Goldie here? And I hope everybody had an enjoyable opening day. Uh, we're back for day two of the, I don't know, 800-day baseball season. Really um, short slates today. Uh, actually, on the DK main, we've only got five games. Um, one of the few Fridays of the season where we will have short slates. Most teams are either continuing a series that they started on a Thursday or starting a brand new series. So um, naturally Fridays, if you've played in the uh, past several years, are a, a large slate, at least for the mains. Um, and we usually have 10, 12 games on them. So um, maybe a nice little refresher uh, or a nice break as we kind of ease our way back into the MLB season here. Um, some interesting matchups tonight. We're just going to kind of go over them. Um, and today we'll probably be able to, I don't have projections or anything loaded just yet. So um, trying to get this out uh, pretty early here in the day. Uh, still working on the back end to get my projections uploaded to the site. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, but we'll probably be able today to get into a little bit more of the, um, the structure that I want to go through, um, kind of on a daily basis, kind of give everybody an idea as to, um, how I do my analysis and my first look at a slate, uh, and all that kind of stuff, um. You know, we'll, we'll go through, as we can see here, I don't, ha I still don't have FanDuel stuff up. Um, that's going to be a little bit until we, we get all of that data. Uh, and, and, and the FanDuel stuff in the models and the projections and everything. So uh, still kind of um, early spring for me as well. Uh, so I appreciate, appreciate everybody's patience on that front. Um, but in terms of raw projections and whatever, uh, Sheets will still be putting his up. Uh, as often as he can, and hopefully between the two of us, um, we can, number one, on, on days where both of us put up projections, we, uh, you guys just have your choice, uh, pick whatever you want, uh, and on days where either one of us are out for whatever reason, um, you still have access to a projection, a, a really good projection aggregate. Um, which is really the value that you get. Not only do we do a lot of the theory behind DFS and um, you know some of the, the fundamental analysis in all of the various sports, uh, but it, it's really the projections that, that provide uh, most of the value uh, because they are um, as accurate as they really can be given that we're we're pumping all of the, or as many of the projection sets from the broader industry into our numbers. Of course, we do make our own tweaks um, for accuracy and, and all that kind of jazz. But uh, suffice to say that you're not going to get a, an aggregate projection um, or a more accurate projection, I suppose, uh, anywhere else. So... Um, for any prospective members, um, you know, thinking about joining us for the baseball season, that's really the uh, the crux of what we offer. Um, we take a, a full pulse of the industry for a projection, uh, a fantasy point projection, and we do the same for ownership. Make some tweaks. And, and then spit out a, a really, really strong aggregate. So uh, it's at that point we can use the numbers to then do our fundamental analysis and all that sort of jazz to build some really strong lineups and, and hopefully make some money. So um, with the housekeeping sort of out of, this, out of the way, uh, let's kind of get into the slate here. Um, like I said, just, uh, just five games on the main and uh, an early start. So you will see, uh, let's see, I believe it starts at uh, 640 Eastern. 
Um, this isn't sorted right. And that that's kind of irritating. Uh, I'll have to fix that later. Um, starting at 6:40 Eastern. So what is that? A, a half hour um, prior to uh, a typical start at uh, seven Eastern. So uh, keep that in mind if you are punting tonight. Um, and let's get into it uh, quickly. We'll um, just pull labs lineup page over here this is free so you can just go uh, use their tool it's um it's one of the the best interactive ones uh it updates pretty regularly um and and i really like it just to kind of keep a pulse on uh lineups throughout the day so um this is probably what i'll be using uh mostly throughout the season until i um develop my own sort of lineup tool in the background um kind of a spoiler for uh for those paying attention in any case let's uh let's get to it uh david peterson jesus lazardo mets and the marlins um now yesterday we had uh scherzer and sandy alcantara on the mound and it was a pretty difficult matchup for sandy just because the mets um their lineup really hasn't changed i mean pretty much at all this is the exact same list as last year they spent most of their money uh in the off season i mean obviously they they do have tommy fam now but um most of their money in the in the off season came with the pitching right with uh with verlander and um and kodai senga who we'll get to uh etc so um they do have Marte, you know back kind of healthy hopefully and uh, Frankie Lindor and Pete Alonso sort of anchoring the top half. Uh, so it was kind of a sticky matchup for Sandy yesterday. Um, same is going to go for Jesus Luzardo here today. Uh, we'll get into the, the matchups you know, really in, in detail here um, in a minute. But um, not a great spot for the Lizard. And at 7,800, uh, it, it's, it's certainly only a five-game slate here. So we can basically play any of these guys um, because they are the number two uh, at, at least the number two in their respective rotation. So um, pretty pretty fine to spread things out if you're playing multiple teams. If you're just punting one team, probably not going to get to Jesus Luzardo today. Uh, I think there's some other spots, namely like a Christian Javier, uh, who you could consider, Merrill Kelly and Dustin May, both in play down here. Um, interesting spot for Nick Martinez. Rocky's going to strike out a crap load. They struck out 17 times last night. Uh, still put up seven runs or whatever it was. So um, really a uh, really interesting spot for Nick Martinez down here. Or the Rockies on the other side. Uh, and then certainly we have Robbie Ray against Cleveland, um, who's probably going to – I mean, we typically haven't liked to target Cleveland because they really don't strike out a lot. They play – uh, strong fundamental baseball, um, but Robbie Ray has certainly has strikeout stuff, and we could consider getting to him um, for sure in perhaps cash or some single entry teams. Uh, David Peterson here, he's going to have a pretty tough time in general, I think, uh, against Miami, as did Scherzer a little bit yesterday. Um, now Miami made some some lineup upgrades. And now they, in the projected lineup here, they don't have Luis Arise, but uh, they let him off yesterday against Scherzer. And while Scherzer survived, and he did fine, um, he really only got through six innings, gave up a late dinger or, or, or whatever to Garrett Cooper. But um, it, was, it was really sticky for him. And he still got him for six Ks in a K in inning, which is, it was great. Um, but Miami... That, that sort of portends to a little bit of uh, what Miami's going to be like this season. They're going to be sticky. There's some guys here, Avi Garcia, Gene Segura, uh, Luis Arise, definitely. Uh, John Birdie, you know, when he can get on base, he's going to steal a crap load of bases this year. Um, of course, Jazzy down here, back healthy. You know, this could be a very sticky lineup. If you see Garrett Cooper kind of turn it around a little bit um, and, and – drop down on the strikeouts. Yuli Gurriel doesn't strike out a little, pretty much at all. 
So this could be a very sticky lineup to navigate for a lot of opposing starters this season, uh, and certainly with David Peterson. We'll get into the into the numbers here in a minute, but I just wanted to mention that. That's one of the first things I noticed kind of right off the bat um, coming out of opening day, that Miami is probably not this season going to be nearly as targetable on a regular basis uh, as maybe they have been in the past. So something to keep in mind. Um so we'll go over quickly the, the Houston and the Sox game. This is a good baseball game last night. Uh, Sox ended up pulling one out late. Um, Javier and Lance Lynn on the mound. Now, price-wise, uh, I think both of these guys are playable. The price for Christian Javier over here on DK jumps out at me a little bit more. 8200 I think there's a lot of upside for him. Um, now, he's a fly ball pitcher, but he's got a lot of really good strikeout stuff. Now, the Sox have generally been kind of difficult to target in in the strikeout department um but last year they were very very frustrating because they did not realize pretty much any of the power uh and offensive upside that they brought to the table a lot of the guys were you know hurt Moncada was hurt Eloy was hurt Luis Robert was hurt Tim Anderson was hurt uh they did bring in Andrew Benintendi who's a little sticky um so it could be once again another difficult lineup to navigate for a lot of uh for a lot of starters this season um if they can really capitalize on a lot of their their offensive upside and really start clicking as a lineup this could be a very very dangerous list so um that said i think javier is perfectly fine to consider today uh we'll get into his numbers as well on the other side um the houston astros they're still not going to strike out uh, it'll be a little elevated this year because they don't have Yuli in here in the five hole, uh, really acting as a, you know, mega pest, um, in the strikeout department. Lance Lynn certainly has strikeout upside and he's a horse. So he's going to go out here and, and he'll throw a hundred pitches and, um, you know, he throw 150 if they let him. So, uh, the pitch count worries that we that we discussed yesterday coming into opening day probably not there for Lance Lynn in general. Um, at 8,800 in this bad strikeout matchup, probably something we're going to want to avoid. But uh, again, it's a five-game slate, and you can get to pretty much everybody um, if you if you'd like to. Certainly in in some short exposures, wouldn't go crazy with it. Uh, but you know anything over 10%, I think, is probably a little aggressive. Uh, in multi-entry stuff, and I think we could target some some better arms in cash or in single-entry three max type of stuff. So um, we talked about the uh, briefly the San Diego and Colorado game here. Bad spot for Kyle Freeland here, even at 7,200, so, semi-attractive price tag. Kyle goes out and he competes a lot. Um, he will he will work really really hard on the mound. Um, that doesn't mean that you know just because he works hard, it, it doesn't really improve his stuff, uh, and it does it certainly doesn't improve the matchup. Here with Xander now, who we talked about, they do have Nelson Cruz who came over, who's going to be DHing. Uh, on the plus side of the split, um, it is still going to be a very difficult lineup for pretty much any opposing starter to navigate. Uh, Juan Soto on the negative side of the split doesn't really matter. It's Juan Soto. Uh, of course, Manny and Kyle have a good bit of history going back to Manny's Dodger days and the several years now that he's spent in San Diego, seen him plenty and, and sees him really well. So um, now Xander, not in terms of, you know, BVP and whatnot, doesn't have a, a large sample against Kyle, but um, still doesn't strike out a lot. He's a very, very good hitter. So a uh, good price for for X. At 4,800, I think this is an interesting stack we could consider um, this evening. On the other side, against Nick Martinez, he's a little jerky in the in the windup and in the motion, so it it brings in some variance to his numbers. And the Rockies look healthy; they look good. Uh, their lineup, although they did strike out a boatload yesterday, uh, and we talked about how they're going to strike out a lot this season. If their hitters are healthy, they're still going to be some offensive upside for them. So um, can't really expect C.J. Crone to go off and hit two dingers again tonight. But uh, very good price tag here for Charlie Blackman, 4,300. Like this a lot. Chris Bryant at 
anything under 5000 I think is really a playable price when he's healthy. 3200 Jonathan Daza leading off at 32. Oh, I already said that, but um, at 32 is it is a nice price tag and a good filler piece for your stacks if you get to them. Uh, Ryan McMahon looks very healthy as well. Had a good spring at 4100 Dual eligibility here. This is a, a nice piece. Probably won't be all that popular this evening uh, a, against a, a very attackable arm in Nick Martinez. So um, they did bring in Mike Moustakis as well. Uh, we'll see if Jerry Profar actually plays. He hasn't been with the team. That's why he didn't start last night. Um, so these two new guys, Jerry and, and Moose, um, Moose has also had a, a pretty decent spring. Looks healthier now as well. He's had a, a bit of a down couple of years uh, and didn't really realize a lot of value in that contract with Cincinnati because he was hurt. But um, healthy Moose uh, still has plenty enough in the tank and in the bat uh, to provide some value definitely at this price tag. So an interesting stack that we can consider as well for the Rockies. Um, a little bit off the board and perhaps pretty contrarian. Uh, I think definitely something you, we want to consider in, in deeper tournament stuff. Um, Merrill Kelly and Dustin May, not super excited about getting to offense in this game necessarily, but uh, Merrill Kelly has, I mean, he had a fantastic season last year. I love playing this guy at a deflated price tag. Really bad matchup here in general going after the Dodgers. Um, really, really good hitters. They brought in JD, of course, and David Peralta. Uh, they did bring up James Outman, did make the team. They also have Miggy Rojas, who did strike out. And if they use him at short, uh, and it, it looks like they're going to most of the season, um, he's going to serve as another bat that's really going to turn the lineup over for them because it, it, he's going to put the ball in play. Uh, and that'll get you back to Mookie, back to Freddie, back to... Uh, Will Smith and Max Muncy at the top of the list. Now, not going to have as much pop since they're uh, obviously missing Trey Turner. But um, if Max Muncy is, is back healthy and Will Smith sort of um, realizes a bit of the the initial upside that he, he brought to the league when he first came up, uh, I, I think the Dodgers are still, they're definitely the team to beat in the NL West, um, on paper, the Padres are, are probably a better team, but uh, they got to do it on the field. And until somebody unseats the Dodgers, like this is still the team to beat out there. So a um, very, very difficult lineup in general to navigate for Merrill Kelly, even though I, I really like his stuff. We'll get into it here in a sec. Um, probably not at this price tag. I think we could consider... Uh, some some other guys, certainly on the other side, like Dustin May. He's got a lot of uh, pretty good strikeout stuff, throws very hard, very hard sinker. Um, one of the best prospects in baseball, Corbin Carroll over here. This is an excellent price for him at 3100 He has He's one of the fastest guys in the league. If he gets on base, um, even in a bad sort of, you know, a raw uh, fundamental pitching matchup for him, since Dustin May is a really re good arm, this price tag too cheap. And same same goes for Cattell Marte. I think you can get to some contrarian Arizona stacks against Dustin May if you'd like. Uh, I wouldn't go super crazy with it. Um, but in deep tournament teams on a 5 game slate, you can play whoever the hell you want, pretty much. Uh, so a very interesting list over here. Uh, this is going to be a, a fun lineup to target. Uh, nobody's going to be playing Arizona because they're not likely to be very good this year. But... Um, Jake McCarthy has value at 3,300, had a good sort of late seasons, um, appearances, I guess, uh, maybe for about a month last year. Uh, Christian Walker, very cheap at 33, not the matchup here for him, but, uh, cause he still strikes out a lot. Um, but keep an eye on these low price tags for all the guys from Arizona, Lourdes coming over from Toronto. And we have Nick Ahmed back healthy, uh, not known for his offensive prowess necessarily, uh, more so for the glove. But, um, you know, a, a very interesting and, and, and fun lineup that we're going to, I think, on several occasions this year, going to be able to, to target for a good bit of value. And this first time that we have the Diamondbacks, uh, didn't have them yesterday, but first time we've got them on the slate this year, I think uh, we can consider getting to you know some of the worst teams and, and, and the lower echelon of the 
NL West and in, in the D-backs and the Rockies um, as some contrarian stacks. So something to consider. Uh, Hunter Gaddis, don't have a lot of data on him. Came up last year, and we've only got about 20 innings or so. We'll get into the pitch mix here in a minute. Um, certainly targetable uh, with the Seattle Mariners. Uh, this is going to be a very, very fun lineup to play all season. Colton Wong over here, probably a little elevated price tag-wise, but he's going to serve as a, a key cog in this list. Um, this is really what they were missing, a, a consistent bat that puts the ball in play and can get on base for the big guys that they brought in, like um, like Tay Oscar. And hopefully Jared Kelnick really uh, kind of breaks out this season. Uh, they do have Tommy LaStella, who is a versatile left-handed bat that they could throw in the list. J.P. Crawford uh, is also very capable to tur in turning the lineup over, and hopefully Julio can uh, mostly stay healthy. This is a killer price tag for Julio at 5,500. Uh, he's probably going to be very, very popular today. Um, but undoubtedly one of the best plays uh, of the slate. Uh, still always like playing Ty France at 4600 uh, I think it's a fine price tag, maybe a little elevated in general for him, but um, definitely playable. You can get to Tay Oscar as well, 53 in in stacks. Not wild about paying over 5 k for Tay Oscar in general, but uh, he has the capability of hitting two out and... Um, Fading that kind of upside, even at kind of an, an elevated price tag, uh, is a dangerous play sometimes. Cal Raleigh, 3,200, really, really like playing him from the left side uh, against righties. And at the, like this is a fantastic price for him. We were paying 5K nearly for him uh, last season. Uh, Gino at 4,200, still very capable as well. Um, kind of had a, a late, season, late season resurgence a little bit. So hopefully he can kind of turn it around and cut down on the strikeouts um, coming into this year. So another fun lineup we're going to like to target, and definitely tonight against Hunter Gaddis, they'll be one of the more popular stacks. On the other side, uh, Cleveland against Robbie Ray, you can always stack against Robbie Ray. There's a lot of variance with him, and certainly you can stack against him with a team that doesn't strike out, right? And you can play Josie Ramirez, okay? You can play Oscar Gonzalez. This is a killer price for him, 3,500. A lot of upside at this price. Um, they also have a, a big power bat down here in Mike Zanino, who strikes out a lot, but uh, hopefully back healthy from his thoracic outlet. Had a really good spring. Um, there's... There's pieces here for the Guardians that can get to Robbie Ray, certainly if he doesn't have the control uh, or just starts piping to baseball like he's wont to do sometimes. So uh, he'll definitely be the chalk arm at 92. That doesn't mean you totally fade him, but in, in deeper tournament stuff, um, it's very viable to come in and, and stack the Guardians. Now, they've got a lot of switch hitters here. They're going to be very sticky once again this season. Um so you could target them on a lot of slates. They're going to be similar to Arizona in in the sense that not a lot of raw upside for them, but they will provide some value for us and some cheap price tags uh, on occasion. So uh, that said, that's the quick overview. Um, let's jump right into it. And as I mentioned, don't have uh, projections loaded just yet. So if we want to kind of target some... Uh, We'll just look at you know briefly some of the some of the pitch mix um, and get into a little bit of the a uh, little bit of the particulars here with with some of these guys. So Lance Lynn, 8,800. Um, we talked about this. You know, he's a horse. He's going to come out and he's going to throw every pitch that he can, and he's going to stay on the mound. Uh, and even if he gets beat up a little bit, he goes deep, about five and two thirds per start. Um, the suppression metrics at right about a four ERA running a little bit cold in terms of expected metrics, but um, that's perfectly well in line for a guy that really only threw 120 innings last year. Uh, Buck 13 whip because he's always had impeccable control. He doesn't walk people. It doesn't beat himself. Now he'll, he'll pitch to contact slightly elevated 75% contract rate. It's, it's perfectly um, within range of what you, would want from a number two starter. He doesn't have a lot of off-speed and, and mix-up type 
type pitches, right? Doesn't throw any of the breaking stuff or change up. He's make mainly a multiple fastball type of guy. Does throw the sinker and uses it still not a very good pitch value relative to the rest of the league for him and mostly relies on the four seamer and a cutter. Um, but will mix in, you know, he'll cut it all sorts of different ways, right? He'll, he'll cut it in on right-handers. He'll also cut it in on left-handers on occasion. So very versatile with the fastball. That's what makes him um, pretty fun to target sometimes. He, he does have a, an elevated strikeout rate of about 24%. So uh, in general, we like targeting Lance Lynn and, and playing him because he's got really good numbers. Uh, buck 10, buck 15, ground ball to fly ball rate, it's fine. So if we're going after Lance Lynn, we want to target him with generally with lefties, right? He's a little bit more susceptible, higher average, and a 172 ISO compared to 144 to the right side. Lower strikeout rate, 1.6 homers per nine. So some susceptibility here for sure for Lance Lynn. That puts us into Jordan Alvarez, Kyle Tucker range with the Houston Astros down here. Um, So that's how we would target him on the other side. Don't really want to go after him with righties, even guys that don't strike out like Alex Bregman. Um, so I'm not super crazy about stacking the Astros here, uh, but I could very reasonably see myself uh, getting to some one-off uh, Jordan Alvarez, Kyle Tuckers, or um, you know who else do they have in the list uh, from the left side. That may actually be it. They're going to be, once again, pretty right-handed heavy. Um as they have been the last several years, that's really what would kind of take them to the next level. Do they need a next level? Well, I don't know. They're they're one of the best teams in baseball, and uh, they won the World Series last year, so, you know, whatever. Um, But those are definitely the targets. They did bring in Josie Abreu, of course. Um, But those are the targets from the left side of the plate against uh, Lance Lynn. Javier, we talked about briefly as well. Huge strikeout rate, but he's a fly ball pitcher, and he's one of the highest fly ball pitcher or high ball fly ball, highest fly ball rates rather, um, in the league. You know, at a, at a full 57 percent. This is a big, big number. What we really need to be careful about when we get into the high fly ball numbers is hard hit rate. Um, this is the stat cast number here, hard hit, and this is the pitch info, um, hard contact rate, a little bit of difference. We'll go into those, you know, sort of as we move through the season, but, uh, you need guys to stay off the barrel when they're getting the ball in the air like this. So hard contact and barrel rates is, is what you're looking for. Um, and Javier's numbers and coupled with the very high strikeout rate north of 30% and, pushing 14% swing strike rate, one of the better numbers in the league, at a CSW of nearly 20, I mean, right at 28%. You want this to be at about 30% to be in the elite tier. And that's, his number is a little bit lower just because he's, he pitches to a bit more contact and he wants to get fly balls. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that his numbers are bad by any stretch. He's got a, an 095 whip here with a 250 ERA. And, you know, the expected metrics, at least XERA, is right in line with that. The XFIP, a little bit higher, and that's because of the fly ball numbers here. So a little bit noisy there. Um, but this is a good homer to fly ball rate for a guy with a, a fly ball rate this high. So that's where, really where we want to focus with Javier. Um his problem has really always been throwing strike one and getting ahead of hitters. As you can see, his elevated walk rate here at about 9%, that's where he can get in trouble. Fly ball pitchers, if they're putting people on base and at all susceptible to getting on the barrel, 7, 7% is a fine number, that's where they can get in trouble. So he relies on the four-seamer slider mix. That's really a, a pretty common mix pitch mix for fly ball pitchers. Doesn't really throw a curveball all that much and doesn't throw a changeup all that much. It's a good thing because they're both negative value pitches for him. So how do we want to target if we are going to target? Well, generally, fly ball pitchers uh, with just two pitches here, we want to target them with same-handed hitters um, in terms of raw power numbers. So you can see the slight difference here to righties with a 143 ISO versus a 129 ISO to lefties. 
the big issue here is, of course, the 40% strikeout rate against right-handers. So it makes him difficult to target. And generally, we don't like stacking against fly ball pitchers uh, because they bring a lot of value in getting fly balls as outs. So a lot of teams will end up popping the ball up instead of hitting the ball over the wall. Certainly, if they're not on the barrel enough, that makes it difficult for us. So um, not super crazy about full stacks here, but you can you can absolutely get to one-offs, and that's really how we'd like to target both of these guys. Let's quickly move on um, to the Colorado-San Diego game. Here's Freeland. Uh, at 72, like I said, it, it's a bad matchup for him. We're going to be want to playing want to be playing him, uh, easy for me to say, at points of this season at this price tag, but certainly not in this matchup because the Padres, we can scroll over here, Last season against lefties, didn't create all that great. Um, really, it's just a league average 101 WRC+. Plus. But as you can see, a 22% strikeout rate. It's about a tick and a half better than average. So 141 ISO, not a lot of power coming from them, but sticky and difficult to navigate as a, as a team. Uh, and now that they brought in Xander Bogarts as well, those numbers are only going to uh, improve for the Padres. So... Um, Kyle has the, the four-seamer sinker-cutter mix, uh, but he does have a full five-pitch mix. Unfortunately for him, you know, three or even four of them are, are really poor value relative to league average for him. So um, uses them a lot. I wish he'd quit throwing the sinker so much against right-handers. Not a very good pitch, and it can float sometimes, and that what... And that's really what can get him in trouble because he's got a high, high barrel rate here. Stat cast hard hit rate of 42%. Anything over 40% is pretty questionable. And when you couple that with a high barrel rate pushing 10%, that's really where you get in trouble. Of course, Kyle pitches most of his games in Coors Field. And that's a recipe for disaster uh, most often. So stuff we need to keep in mind with Kyle. He had a much better season last year than uh, previous when he got sent down. Uh, because he was so, so bad. So he's figured it out a little bit, but still very susceptible to hard contact and getting on the barrel. Um, just a buck 20 ground ball to fly ball, so a very slight um, a slight susceptibility to getting the ball in the air. And when we couple that with the barrel rate, as I mentioned, that's where we want to really target uh, from an offensive standpoint and really avoid from a... a a pitcher standpoint, right? 1.8 homers to 9 to the left side of the plate. Admittedly, a small sample, just 35 and two-thirds from last year, but a big, big ISO number here against lefties, 235. So a bit of a reverse split that, he's, that he exhibits. Um, high average, so, to, and that's really to both sides of the plate. 315 to the lefties, 271 to righties. So we can target him with both sides of the plate, and you can definitely stack the Padres here. They're going to be one of the more popular stacks. Uh, pretty much all season, but definitely in a spot where they get a guy that's not going to throw it past anybody with just a 17% strikeout rate. So, uh, like the Padres here a good bit. Um, Price-wise, probably going to want to target... Uh, I don't have their lineup in here um, since we had had them on the late slate last night, but probably going to want to target, you know, the, the typical guys, Bogarts, Machado. You could throw in Soto. He doesn't strike out, and he hits lefties perfectly fine. Nelson Cruz, 3,800, uh, probably on the back end of I mean, definitely on the back end of his career, but um, had a down season last year coming over from the AL to the NL. Maybe a little bit more familiar with pitching this year, but certainly somebody you can involve in your stacks. If you wanted to just run a three-man, I think that's perfectly fine. A four-man adding in Soto, fine as well. You want to make it cheaper with a ha Sung Kim or an Austin Nola. That's perfectly respectable. On a short slate, you can throw in Jose Azokar if he is in the outfield uh, down here at the bottom of the list also. So I do like the Padres for sure. Um, and on the other side, I talked about you can get to a contrarian stack of the Rockies. Uh, bad four-seamer here from Nick Martinez. 7,300, I don't really want to deal with this, even though the Rockies strike out a crap load. He's only got a, about a 21% a strikeout rate in aggregate. Now, 350 ERA with expected metrics, a little bit higher than that, so perhaps a tiny bit of regression coming for him. Buck 29 whip, which is respectable because he, he mostly keeps the ball on the ground at a buck 40 ground ball to fly ball rate. Not a hell of a lot of contact, certainly 
elevated slightly at, at 75%, but really his problem and that what contributes to most of the whip here is a bad four seamer, which he throws a full 25% of the time, and he can't, when he gets deep into counts, he's not throwing strikes. And because he certainly throws strike one at 65% clip. That's a really, really good number. 9% full walk rate is questionable, uh, to say the least. So it's not really totally susceptible to hard hit and hard contact. Um, anything in the in the 25% pitch info range, it's a, it's a really, really good number. Soft contact, anything over 17% is a pretty good number as well. So those numbers are fine. And he gets the ball on the ground, so he's a respectable arm. And against a team that will strike out a lot, it could certainly elevate his uh, his potential for uh, to outperform his aggregate numbers here at 21%. Uh, if he pops at 7,300 against a team that strikes out a lot, you know, don't be surprised. But certainly has a major weakness with a. Um, a pretty bad four seamer relative to league average. Only throwing it 94 does sink it, and he will cut it as well. So he he has some valuable uh, mixture that he can throw in into the pot here, and he has a pretty decent changeup. So he can navigate some lists, and certainly a list that will strike out a lot. But you can play both sides of this game. Um, Really, everybody from the Padres, everybody from the Rockies. If we are targeting guys from the Rockies, it would mostly be lefties. Buck 76 ISO and 1.7 homers per nine that we'd want to target. We mentioned Charlie Blackman uh, and Ryan McMahon at cheap price tags. Uh, okay, so let's move on to Cleveland. Talked about Hunter Gaddis. Not a big sample. Just, uh, what, seven and a third innings here. Um, really not a lot of pitches from him. So uh, not a not a lot of data in the, in the short sample throwing the four seamer a lot it got blasted only throwing it at about 94 so he's he's piping it here um, had trouble throwing strike one and getting ahead of hitters that didn't necessarily translate to walk rates but what that means is he's then just throwing it right over the middle of the plate and he's gonna get blasted so with a without plus plus velocity and plus plus off speed and or breaking stuff, if you can't throw strike one, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So Seattle is in a very, very good spot tonight. Uh, they will probably be the chalk stack along with the Padres. So keep that in mind when you're just when we're clicking in uh, a bunch of Mariners. Uh, low strikeout rate, pitched to a lot of contact in this short sample. I would ignore most of these numbers down here, but um, the stuff that will converge a little bit faster are the K rate and and the strike one rate definitely that's that's a key key metric um certainly for young pitchers when they're coming up so uh look at this 28 percent barrel rate this will you're you're gonna be hard pressed to find anybody over 11 percent um a la patrick corbin uh over a large sample so this is like most of this stuff down here is is total noise and we're gonna need to need bigger samples out of Hunter before we can make some ultimate judgments, but um, keep an eye on how often he's getting ahead of hitters because if you can't get ahead of hitters and you can't throw strikes, uh, you're going to have problems. So uh, Seattle is an excellent stack tonight. Here's Robbie on the other side, 9,200. Once again, he'll he'll be the chalk arm. Uh, threw a ton of innings last year, 27.5% K rate, 371 ERA with expected metrics right in the, in the same range, buck 20 whip. Little bit of susceptibility still with the walk rate. He throws strike one. It's it's elevating the pitch count because he throws it over the middle of the plate and he gives up some hard contact still. Uh, so he gets deep into into counts, um, not because he's not getting ahead, but because mostly like he's throwing it over the plate enough that guys are fouling off a lot of pitches. So. Um, but the 27.5% K rate is perfectly respectable to go after against Cleveland. But as I alluded to earlier, they don't create a, at a, a whole, you know, like a an elevated clip here. But um, just a 21% strikeout rate, one of the best numbers in the league against lefties last season. So uh, 
with an elevated walk rate at 8% and some susceptibility to getting on the barrel and giving up some hard contact, um, as a fly ball pitcher, you can absolutely stack against Robbie Ray, target him with one-offs, uh, however you want to do it. Because, as you, as we see here, 236 average, 323 ro WOBA, and a 195 ISO against righties last year with a decreased strikeout rate, of course, on the negative side of the split. 092 ground ball to fly ball, so a fly ball pitcher with an elevated pitch info card, hard contact rate here at 35%, full 1.7 homers per nine. So that's where we want to target Robbie if we're going after him. It, that means you're in Oscar Gonzalez and Josie Ramirez range. Uh, you can also consider some of Med Rosario, 4,600, probably elevated a little bit, but he has speed and plenty of upside on the base pass that's not quite priced in here yet. 47 for Josh Bell. He will switch hit, but his better side of the plate is uh, by far the left. So not super ecstatic about going after him at this price tag. And first base is a generally really deep position. I think we can probably find better values, better raw value spots than Josh Bell here. Um, but if you're throwing him in, into stacks, I think it's perfectly fine. Talked about Oscar 35. I think this is a great play here. Uh, to get off of some of the Robbie Ray chalk. And Gabriel Arias here is a cheap second, third base play that you could consider at 2200 to fill out a stack if you need it. Uh, mentioned Mike Zanino. All the power in the world, but will strike out a crap load. So keep that in mind. Uh, Miles Straw, one of the fastest guys in the league, if he can get on base. So definitely a playable stack and plenty of ways that you can uh, manipulate it here to, to get different. Not that you necessarily would need to. Um, but if you need some cheaper pieces, they are here. So uh, talked about all of these guys over here on, on Seattle. You can play pretty much everybody, in, including a Tommy LaStella. Really would, it, outside of deep tournament stuff, would, would stay away from playing, um, you know, really cheap sort of trap value bats down here at the bottom of the lineup. Like a Tommy LaStella, who is a, a pinch hit magnet, right? Um so I'd be careful with that, but pretty much everybody else, they're they're going to start, they're going to stay in the list. So I uh, wouldn't really worry about that. You're going to have to get different, though, if you're stacking Seattle. Uh, okay, let's get to the last game really quick. Been yapping here for quite a while, but this is or the last couple of games. Um, this is kind of the structure I want to go through. Uh, here's Arizona. Oh, I've got to, you know, we have... I have to change all of my stuff. Uh, MLB changed the the abbreviation on me from ARI to AZ, so I have to go in and change all my stuff here. But this is Merrill Kelly. Um, we can actually come over here. I believe I've got him on the uh, on the other sheet. We can just kind of briefly talk about all of his numbers. Here he is. was a horse last year through 200 innings um, and had relatively good numbers, right? Very low swinging strike rate at sub 10%. That's not really what we're looking for, but decent chase at about 29%. Stays really off of the barrel for the most part. 8% is about league average. Um, he is a, a buck 10, buck 15 ground ball to fly ball guy, similar to um, a couple of these guys in the list here today. And he's got, I, I believe, five pitches from memory. So perfectly... Uh, respectable to navigate the Dodgers here. Uh, slightly elevated contract contact rate, which is really kind of what we want to avoid uh, when we're going after the Dodgers. They don't swing and miss. They're very patient, even though Max Muncy did strike out five times last night. So uh, in general, not the best spot for Merrill Kelly. Um, but for the most part, you know, 225 average allowed. Uh, really not a huge susceptibility to either side of the plate. Um, you know, a 19% strikeout rate to lefties, 10% walk rate slightly elevated, but uh, just a 314 woba. That's a fine number. And of course, over here to righties, naturally quite a bit better. Buck 15 ISO with a 267 woba and a 5% walk rate. Right. So 072 homers per nine and 123 homers per nine to the right and left side of the plate, respectively. So really not something overly targetable in that sense. But you could always stack the Dodgers, one of the best lineups in baseball as well. On the other side, Dustin May. Um, we talked about he's got a killer sinker. He relies on that. He throws it very, very hard. Doesn't use the four seamer. 
Um, he actually does use the four seamer. Excuse me. The uh, at a full 23%. I was looking at this number when I said he doesn't. Um, so it, it's pretty marginal value for him, even though he's throwing it 98. But there's the value here. About twice as valuable relative to the four seamer is the sinker for him. So very hard. Throws it down and in to righties and down and away to lefties. He'll cut it a little bit, but that's kind of a um, a mixture of the slider that he's trying to throw. So it's basically the combination here at, at of the cutter and the slider at relatively neutral value. He's trying to mix in a fifth sort of variant pitch here in the changeup. Not quite comfortable with it uh, just yet, but that will develop as he, he gets more... Um, big league innings under his belt as we as we see here just 30 inning sample not a ton from him just yet um so we'll have to you know keep an eye on him uh a little bit of susceptibility in throwing strike one sub 60 percent first pitch strike rate that's a little questionable and even though he does throw hard and has k stuff he doesn't really capitalize on it. he does pitch to contact and wants ground balls right high high ground ball rate of buck 75 per um, so very difficult to target in general, unless we want to go after him with guys that can get the baseball in the air. And that is from the, uh, Diamondback standpoint, let's bring up the lineups page again. Uh, Corbin Carroll can get the ball in the air. He's more of a line drive hitter, but Cattell Marte also has plenty of, uh, fly ball capability in the bat. Jake McCarthy for sure. Um, Josh Rojas, not necessarily, but Alec Thomas a little bit. Uh, hopefully he can turn a corner, having gotten a lot of really good playing time in the WBC uh, against elite, elite competition. Um, so those are really the guys we'd probably like to target. Carroll, Ma uh, Marte, and McCarthy at the top of the lineup. Uh, would likely stay away from any of the righties here. Um, at Dustin Mays, just, his ground ball rate is too high in general. Um, but if we do want to target him, like he, he may be a little bit susceptible, uh, to a little bit more contact from the right side of the plate, um, uh, because the, the, the four seamer while valuable is kind of negated a little bit here by the cutter. So he floats it a little bit. Um, and he, he's, he's a young pitcher still. He's got some variance in him. Uh, but you could play him here at 8,400, uh, as well. Um, only a few guys over there on the Diamondbacks that you're really kind of scared of. So if you want to mix him into your tournament pool, probably not a single entry play would be concerned a little bit with upside. But again, it's a five game slate and you can really play whoever you want. All right. Last game here. Um, well, first game, I suppose. Uh, we did talk about David Peterson. I love the price here. He has upside at, with a 28% K rate. Um, Suppression metrics at 383, 394, 331 expected. These are fine for a middle of the rotation type of starter. Buck 33 whip, 233 average allowed. All fine numbers. His problem is throwing strike one. It really always has been. In a 100 inning sample last season, only throwing strike one at 52%. That is a terrible, terrible number. And that's what leads to the high walk rate. So despite the high strikeout rate, he's putting himself in really bad bad spots this strikeout rate would be six eight percent higher if he could increase the strike one rate uh and get this pushing to 60 percent um because he has the swinging strike stuff and he has the called strike stuff pushing 28 percent csw it's getting ahead of hitters that is really his problem he's not necessarily on the barrel too terribly stat cast hard hit rate over 40 it's okay little susceptible to some hard contact, really mostly uh, from the left side of the plate, to be quite honest. But anything over 30% is questionable and, and something you need to take note of. So in raw power numbers, he's been a reverse split guy. 176 average, so not so much there, but a 283 Woba, slightly elevated, and a full 200 ISO to the left side. High, high K rate there, so some variance for sure, but gives up a lot of power to the lefties. And that's in a short sample, so perhaps a bit a bit of noise coming through there as well. 80 full innings against righties, 252 average. That's not nothing. It's a big number. And there's where the walk rate really spikes a, a good bit, full 
So he doesn't really have a, a good off speed um, or breaking pitch that he can go to with a lack of a of a plus plus change or a plus breaking pitch. Uh, and he throws the sinker at a full 12 percent two righties as well uh, and it's really not a good pitch for him that's what floats and that's what leads to the high walk rate and a higher um, higher power numbers to both sides of the plate so uh, some susceptibility here for David Peterson uh, he might be popular here at 6600 because he's going to get the Marlins I like stacking the Marlins here there'll be a contrarian stack uh, Gene Segura and if Luis is, l- arises in the lineup as well he didn't strike out against lefties either um, you know, he, he's not going to provide a whole hell of a lot of power, but I think it's a, a perfectly fine and respectable way to consider building list today. John Birdie, for sure. I like 4,300. Uh, he stole so many bases last year that this pre- he was he was upwards and over 5K most of the season. Um, this is a steal for him, so to speak. And if he gets on, he will steal against lefties. He'll steal third base as well. So uh, you can see John Birdie here put up a very, very big number tonight. Um, Garrett Cooper as well, 3,200, excellent price tag. He also got, uh, Scherzer yesterday. So it's a far better matchup for him. David Peterson is not Max Scherzer. So, uh, if Garrett Cooper coming into the season, you know, he was hurt a little bit last year, probably contributed a good bit to his down numbers. Um, but he's always had enough upside to at least maintain a, a regular starting role on a major league club so there's something to be said for that uh we talked about jazzy being healthy again at 5100 he's got plenty of upside from the left side of the plate as well and i think there's a good contrarian play at an elevated price tag so i'm not stoked about that but in a good fundamental spot against david peterson who could be susceptible to giving up some power to the left side uh georgie soler for sure back healthy again as well 3800 i think this is a pretty damn good value play that you can squeeze into your Miami teams. Um, Abby Garcia, more of a filler piece, not a core. I would stick to most of the top of the lineup here, certainly with a home team in Miami. But Yuli Gurriel, I don't want to play him at first base, but you can throw him in as well if you need the 3,000. So uh, good contrarian stacks here that I think we can get to overall on the day. Miami, Arizona, Colorado. You can play some Cleveland as well against a very popular Robbie Ray. So um, that's kind of where we are, guys. Uh, I know we're kind of long-winded. I'm still getting into the swing of things once again uh, as well. So we'll tighten up the analysis and and try to keep things short. But um, this is mostly going to be the structure going into the season. I'll try and go through every game. Um, as quickly as possible, and when we have more, uh, a, a better feel for all of these players and, and the pitchers and everything and, and things that have changed, um, then things should pick up quite a bit. But uh, in the early parts of the season, uh, I hope this is serving as some value to get everybody back into the swing of things. Um, and yeah, that's how we're going to kind of approach it the rest of the year. Once again, uh, keep an eye out for projections. Uh, I will announce in the Discord. Uh, when we've got those available um, as we work through some technical sort of issues on the back end. But um, hopefully that will, uh, you know, it should be pretty easy to, to build some teams here tonight uh, on, on just a short slate. So enjoy the uh, one of the few Fridays that we're, we're going to see with, um, you know, five games on a main slate. Uh, once again, don't forget that at 640 Eastern is, is lineup lock. Uh, but enjoy it. As we uh, as we churn through the first week here, um, good luck everybody, and uh, we'll catch you tomorrow.